was here first. Metal theologian. Did you, when you were a kid, were you a Christian and did you listen to Striper? You must have. You know who Striper is, don't you, metal theologian? Uh, let's see, a thousand pine points to you. Uh, Oak River, you write this stuff down. A thousand pine points to metal theologian. And uh, let's see, who was second? Yeah, Maria McIntyre, 500 pine points. And third is Linguisti. Linguisti, first time getting on stream in time. Yes, and plus you pick up 250 pine points. Uh, this is the punchline. Lycona, Dr. Michael Lacona and Dr. What's his name? Josh Pelletier. See, I'm from Canada. I know how to pronounce. <laughs> I, probably, I probably did it wrong. But that's a French word. French last name. Pelletier. Pelletier. Uh, is a student of Mike's. I, does he have his PhD? Yeah, I think so. Or maybe this is his dissertation? His thesis? I don't know. Let's assume he has a PhD. Give him more, uh, more gravitas. Here's the punchline. The punchline is people who want to feel uh, good about what they believe when it comes to Christianity want the Gospels to be written as early as possible, written by as many eyewitnesses as possible. They want the reliability to be as high as possible. They want the ability for eyewitnesses, if it were false, to denounce it as much as possible, to give it more gravitas. They want all these things because if all that is true, then they can have more confidence that what they read in the Bible in the New Testament is true. I think that's fair, what I just said. Now, here's the difference between... Oh, he's not a doctor, says Camille. He's a just he's just a master. Don't say just a master's. Having a master's degree is is in some ways even more valuable than a PhD because you're probably a little more well rounded. Those PhD types, they're just like so focused in on on one certain thing that there's this. Those PhDs are stupid when it comes to street smarts and and other things in life. I say that because I have two master's degrees. So, hey, Josh, if you're listening, I know Mike and Josh will listen to this. I know it like, like they know that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, uh, kudos to you for having a, just a master's degree. Hey, thank you for the donation, Ken Hovens. Uh, Burton Cummings retweeted me? Wow, you're famous. You're famous, Ken Hovens CPA. But that's the punchline with uh, all this. But when I... So there's three videos that uh, Mike Lacona made. The third one just ended mere minutes ago, maybe an hour ago. And I started to thinking, hey, wait a minute. I interviewed Michael Lacona uh, about a year ago. And where is it? It's right here. 7,613 views from a guy at that time only had maybe 5,000 subs. That's pretty good. And, uh, and the views on... Um, on Mike Lacona's, uh, let's see, let's, let's see, on part one and part two, how many views did they get? You may be like... Oh, not bad. 2.5K on when the Gospel of Mark was written, 1.3K views on who wrote it, and this was uh, who was Peter's source. So we're, we're just going to watch that one today, but I want them to get even more views because I just love these guys so much. Uh, let's back it up to about there. But before we do that, I want to do a recap of my interview with uh, Michael Lacona back in February 12th, 2019. And I want to show you guys that, sorry, Josh, sorry, we learned nothing new from your research because everything that you said to Michael Lacona in your last three videos, Michael Lacona already knew and told me about, but maybe you were doing this while, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. Maybe this was in process, and the reason why Michael Lacona knew the stuff he did is because of you. So let's assume the best uh, of that. But this was uh, the speed round with Michael Lacona back in uh, early 2019. Probability that someone is alive. I, you know, looking back at this, I'm going to be harsh on myself. I was like, I don't know what was wrong with me. I was a little too uh, aggressive here. But I th in my defense, I'm just so sick and tired of when I'm asking a question that they just don't give me the headline answer and just don't answer, like answer right away. I've uh, to 70 years old today, like even that's like, I think 50-50 today. 
You, Look, I have no idea for today. I'm just giving you the, the data. Yeah, the point I was making there is that uh, how many people, what's the chances, what's the probability you'll live over 70 years old today? And I think it's less than 50%. Actually, no, 72. Uh, 78? What's the average? What's the mean? In the United States. Anyhow, it's close to 50-50, especially if it's 90, you know, what's the probability someone would live to 90 years old? It's way below 50%. So the point is that many of the potential eyewitnesses that could have uh, shown said, hey, what, what uh, the author of the Gospel of Mark wrote down, that's false. I was there. That's false. The probability of someone living that long back 2,000 years ago it has to be under 50%. Isn't that reasonable to say? I think it's extremely reasonable, especially if you add to that that uh, it was written, the Gospel of Mark maybe was written in Rome. By the way, in I think it was in the first one, uh, for the those atheists who like this sort of thing and you, need, you like to take clips, uh, I think it's in part one, Josh and Mike admit that the majority of people they surveyed, is that the right word, surveyed, or went this the journals they went through, um, believe that the Gospel of Mark was written in Rome. And for those of you who know how to use Google Maps, Rome is about a thousand miles from Jerusalem. That's a long camel walk. That's, it, and it's a pretty long boat ride, too. <laughs> so imagine the document written in Rome and then having to be spread out back down to Jerusalem. And then an eyewitness in Jerusalem saying, oh, uh, yeah, wait, hey, no, no, this is wrong. Anybody living so if, over if the Christ ages wants to say that nobody was alive. No, I want to see what no, data no, he no, has no, no. See, this is the problem that I think a lot of. Uh, sorry, Michael, but this is the difference between. This is why I was so frustrated with Michael here. It's like I was saying the probability of someone living that long is under 50%, and he's saying to say that nobody would be alive. It's like, you're not hearing me. I'm not saying nobody's not alive. Somebody's alive, of course. There's a difference between saying nobody will be alive to probably someone is dead or alive. I'm not making a blanket statement that it's impossible. I'm making a, probabil a probability statement, which is what history is well, about, right? I think right? MacGyver has shown that it's probable 600 to 1,100 eyewitnesses would still have been alive in the 90s. Probable, even if that's true. I don't know who this guy, but Mike quotes some guy that 600 to 1,100 eyewitnesses would still be alive in the 90s when the Gospel of John was written, sort of, in that area. Uh, out of how many people? That Like if 600 out of 60,000 in Jerusalem, 6,000 in Jerusalem, that's only 10%. That's still below 50. It's like simple things like this. I kind of start to wonder, these, hard, these historians need to have a hard science background instead of like, playing saxophone <laughs> in undergraduate. Okay. Um, I played saxophone. Um, let's move on. Uh, now, I want to ask you, true or false, from the, from the viewpoint of consensus, New Testament consensus, uh, no. that the first gospel was written, A, prior to 65 AD or around, or B, uh, after 65 AD? The first gospel. What would consensus well, say? Well, like, like I said, the... Uh, my son-in-law and I, we went to Emory. We got 75 critical scholars writing on this since 1965. A or B? And the majority, the majority say it was written 50 to 70 AD. That's important. So back in early 2019, before I think Josh's uh, research was out, the majority say that the Gospel of Mark was written 50 to 70 AD. Um, now, that's a big span because what if 80 percent of that majority thinks it's 65 to 70 that makes a difference why does it make a difference because the writing was on the wall that the that the, the jewish war that would have happened in 70 a.d people could see it coming no special spiritual x factor special sauce needed to predict that it would be like uh the years prior to uh the iraq war and taking Saddam out, like people, you know, the writing's on the wall. If someone said, I got a vision from God that the Americans are going to go in and take Saddam Hussein out. It's like, whoa, that's an amazing prophecy. Not really. So you want to say 65. I'm just saying what the, con what the majority, there is no consensus okay. on it. But the majority says that Mark was written between 50 and 70 AD. And by the way, 
the majority also think, and it's a slight majority, it's still a majority though, but the slight majority says that Mark's primary source was Peter, the apostle. And even though it's a slight majority, that is a far cry from Ehrman's claim and the one that the Oxford Annotated Bible says... He brings it up because I brought it up. That we have no idea who wrote the Gospels. and they, That's not what the Annotated Oxford Bible says. By they, the aren't, they aren't rooted in eyewitness testimony. So you're, It does say that. You're, the okay. majority of scholars aren't saying that. 50 to 70. 50 is, to 70. Okay. Um, and that surprised me because I always thought it was 65 to 70 is what the majority thought. It's 50 to 70. Remember these... I know it's hard to remember numbers, but remember these numbers. Because I think uh, when I play this clip later, uh, I think uh, Josh's research does say that the majority think it is between 65 and 70. So when you hear Christians say, oh, the majority, Mike Lacona says, and Josh Pelletier say that it's before 70, well, if it's the majority say it's like 65 to 70, yeah, that's fine. By the way, I, I don't know if I said this already, but... If the Gospel of Mark was written in 34 AD, and if it was like 99.9% .9 certain or confident that um, Mark was a, a good friend of Peter, and it was written one year after Jesus ascended into heaven, that doesn't change my position at all. It's like that evidence is still insufficient to match that claim a man rising from the dead. But it really gives Christians like Mike Lacona uh, and others confidence. Uh, true or false, the author of Mark cites his sources. Not in a direct manner, possibly in an indirect manner as Plutarch does. Can you give one example of an indirect manner? Well, I gave you the one with Plutarch and Asinius Pollio. No, no, Mark. It could very... I know. I'm just giving you that from Plutarch. In Mark, it could be the case like uh, um, when when Mark mentions the women at the crucifixion or at the empty tomb. It could be that's because he's... Yeah. Th what does this sound like to you, Camille? This sounds like uh, Richard Bauckham, right? Doesn't he say stuff like this? It's like, uh, well, if, if the author mentions certain people, we've got to assume that those people are alive and could uh, denounce it. And so th therefore, they're a source or something to that effect. It's just... It works in fiction, too, that you can mention people and are now they're the source of the fictional writing. Naming his witnesses. Or when uh, the angel tells the women at the tomb, go tell the disciples and Peter that he's gone ahead into Galilee, and there you will see him. It's possible that Peter was one of the sources there. Okay. okay. I don't so know. The author Mark, there's possibilities. So the author of Mark does, does not cite his sources directly, but maybe indirectly. Okay. Possibly indirectly. Uh, true or yeah, the reason why I'm asking these questions is to uh, have Christians hear from someone on their team say that the author of Mark did not cite his sources directly. I'll even give Mike Lacone indirectly if he wants it. Um, because here's the thing. It, at some point, they will have to admit that direct citation of sources is better than indirect. I think it's very reasonable for Christians to say that. Now, they can make excuses like, well, back then they didn't do it that way. So what if back then they didn't do it that way? Why lower your standards for claims such as these and say, oh, well, I'm going to loosen my standards because it's so far ago, so then I'm more likely to believe this, that a man rose from the dead. No, stop it. Keep your standards high. Jesus would want that. <laughs> or false, the author of Mark identifies himself in the first person. Um, no. What interests me about this is that he's thinking about it. Like, I don't have to think about that question. When I was a Christian, someone, the Gospel of Mark identifies himself in the first person. No. That would be me, a Christian, 30 years ago. No, he doesn't. So what? What's your point, you evil atheist? Like, <laughs> but it's easy to answer it. But Mike, the first person. But Mike looks up and thinks about it. Person. Um, no, I don't think so. Okay, very good. Um, true or false, the gospel, uh, the other he gospels... He doesn't identify himself in the third person, I mean, because he's not there. If he's getting his information from Peter, he's not... Yeah, he's not there. He's not in the story. 
he's not in the story that he's writing about. He's not going to be identifying himself in first, second, or third person. First or third person. The other Gospels, other than Mark, are independent of Mark. True or false? Um, I would only say John was independent of Mark. He may have known of Mark, but he is certainly independent of Mark. And Matt I made a mistake here. I should have said 100% uh, represents full dependence. 0% means totally uh, independent. Where would you put the Gospel of John? And I don't, I don't think Michael Lacona would put it at 0%, meaning that it's totally independent. Like, even if he says it's independent of the synoptics, he would say there's a little bit of dependence there. Matthew and Luke use Mark as their primary source, but they also supplement it with independent, like the Q material, special M, special L material. Okay, so I'm hearing you say John maybe is independent, but not the no, others. No, John is independent. John is independent. The others aren't. Okay. Uh, the others aren't entirely independent, but but don't go as far as saying that Matthew and Luke are entirely dependent on Mark. They're not. They use other sources. Yeah, other sources we do not have, which I'm sure he would agree with. Okay, um, this one is not true or false. This one is, um, we'll do a bit more of this and then what we'll go into you the other one. agree, strongly agree, disagree. So this is actually a little easier because you don't have to put yourself in a binary box. Uh, the New Testament authors sometimes misquote the Old Testament. Strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. Okay, now, uh, <laughs> I know apologists hate this. Not so much historians, but apologists hate this, like, just to give, strongly agree, agree. Let's see how, I forget how M Michael does here. Um, I would say that they use a, a, a charismatic exegesis, which was common for Jews in that day to do. We would say misquoting uh, by our standards, but by their standards, uh, I'd say no. But, uh, okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, because in the ancient Near East, they took liberties, right, Michael? They took, uh, they exaggerated things, they changed things, they used hyperbole. Uh, some would say they even thought lying was good if it served a greater good. Man. Number two, there's contemporary evidence for the life and ministry of Jesus. Contemporary meaning during the life of Jesus and maybe even five years afterwards, after his death. Agree? Uh, agree. Five years after his death? No, probably not, unless po perhaps some of the oral tradition involved. I mean, you have even that we skeptical have. scholars like you have skeptical scholars like Rob. If you see me like doing this, it's like if, if you're not a Christian or not an evangelical, you know exactly why I'm kind of. Robert Funk of the Jesus Seminar and Garrett Ludeman, who would say that some of the oral tradition like we have in First Corinthians 15, 3 through 7, goes back to within months, two to three years at most, they would say. Now, I, I think that that is a little bit generous. It could go back that far, but I don't know that we could could actually say that and that's skeptical scholars we, we have Atheist zero scholars saying true, that. true or false we have zero evidence during the life of jesus things that we have found written produced during the life of jesus dated to that time during during the life of jesus about jesus um yeah we don't have that and we don't look how long it took to get that answer out of him like i can tell apologists historians christian historians whatever i'm trying to get you set to say what i want you to say and I know you agree with it, so just say it already. <laughs> like, I don't have to hide anything. I, it's not like I'm being this evil manipulative. He knows the answer to this, but he wants to add stuff to it for the Christian listeners listening um, to hear someone who they respect say, yeah, no, we don't have anything written, no tablets, no nothing uh, about Jesus during the life of Jesus and even five, ten years after. Nothing. Zero zip nada. We have nothing. And then, and for a Christian to just say that, a Christian historian to say that, and just without saying the word but afterwards, it's so difficult for them. It's like, I don't want to lead people away from Jesus. I got to, but we wouldn't expect to have this. You <laughs> don't even have it five years and probably even 10 years after, correct? Well, we might, we might with the oral tradition. No, but oral is not something we can touch. I'm it's still evidence. It's it's and it has been embedded in Paul's letters. So it is. But Paul's yeah. And here's the thing: we have Paul's the very first source, very first piece of evidence we have for Christianity. And sure, you can say that 
that he heard this creed beforehand. But we have nothing to verify that. For example, assume the worst of Paul. I'm not saying you should do this of all history. You should assume the worst or the best. Just look at what you have. But let's assume for just for, for, for kicks and giggles that Paul was a, a liar. Now, how would we verify what he said, that this creed even existed, was true? We have nothing to back what Paul says. We have nothing to back it up. We have zero, zip, nada. Before Paul wrote about the creed, we have zero evidence to support that creed. We just have to take Paul's word for it. And I think guys like Mike Lacona would agree with that. Now, he would say, think, well, why would Paul lie about such a thing? Well, fair enough. But I'm just making the point that this is our only source for it. Letters are written now. in 55 or so, right? So that wouldn't okay, count. Okay, so um, why wouldn't it count? You mean to tell me that if this someone question, is writing... This question is about You mean to tell zero me if, to if someone is writing about 35. the Civil War today, the American Civil War, but quoting from a letter written by a veteran of the Civil War, that that doesn't count? It no, yes, it does not count for this question, because the question is from the... From, yeah, but if there's a letter about a Civil War, and that's the only thing we have, then you could say, that's the only thing we have. This letter about the Civil War, about this specific historical event, could be false. I thought history was about having, you increase your confidence when you have two or more independent sources and so forth and so on. And it just, it seems like you have to pull this out of Christians, out of historians, out of apologists. It's just like, yeah, this is, Paul's all we have. You're right, Doug. Uh, And that's about 20 years after the reported events so therefore, we have zero zip, not a contemporary evidence for the life and ministry of Jesus. Nothing. In fact, Paul himself says very little about the life and ministry of Jesus. From Jesus' birth to his death and plus 10, do we have anything written about him? Any evidence at all? Any inscriptions? Anything? I think uh, we're both agreed the answer is no, correct? Um, uh, yeah. That, I, if you want to phrase it the way you have phrased it, that it has to be in writing and it had to be written down at that time, then that would, that would be correct. Yeah, the thing is, even oral tradition, how would you know oral tradition exists unless later on it was written down? It, it's, we can't close our eyes and imagine the evidence. It's like, it, it just it doesn't work that way. Well, it can't be in the ether because the oral traditions are, those people are all dead now. So uh, it would have to be passed on a different way. Hey, welcome, uh, Echo, th- welcome Echo Code 2. Good to see you here. Three. Well, if the message, though, is preserved later in writing, then we still have it. The gospel reports events that we would expect to be recorded by others. Ooh, I like this one. Uh, perhaps. I mean, perhaps. you got uh, Ulysses Grant's two volumes on the American Civil War, his, his memoirs. How about the... How about... Uh, the whole land going dark for three hours when Jesus died? Is that an event that you would expect others to record? How about people? I know Mike Lacona doesn't believe this is history, but what about the claim that the dead came out of the graves and walked around Jerusalem? Do you think that's an event that we would expect others to record? How about the temple curtain, which is a big deal, being ripped in two? Is that an event that we would expect to be recorded by some Jewish historians? I think so. And were there people at that time that could have recorded this? I think so. Never mentions the Emancipation Proclamation. We'd expect that. In Josephus's autobiography, we would expect that he would mention his capture by the Romans. So I'm hearing an agree. I'm hearing an agree. Yet he makes no mention (laughs) of it. So it's not unusual. This is my advice to guys like Mike Lacona. Just answer the question. The Gospels report events that we would expect be recorded by others. Say yes, full stop. Romans just wrote about things that applied to them. The Christians wrote about things that applied to them. They rarely mentioned things. Hey, thanks, uh, Lavington. Things like Augustus or Tiberius. Do you think the Romans would, so, would write about three hours of darkness at Jesus' oh. resurrection? Or do you think that not didn't happen? <laughs> if it did happen, do you think some no, Romans would have written I, about it? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe. <laughs> this is good. I, I didn't remember this. Maybe it was just bad weather. Depends why they... Maybe it, it depends why they were writing, you know? But I'm biased, of course. Um, number four, the Gospels present eyewitness. Oh, we already talked about this. Uh, number five. Okay, that's enough of this. Now let's get back to... Uh, so remember, th- I played that to show that back over a year ago, 
I think before Josh did his research, Josh is his former student, if you came late, who has this new research results on uh, the Gospel of Mark, dating, authorship, and so forth, that even back then, uh, Mike Lacona was saying the majority say that the Gospels were written uh, pre-70 AD. The majority think that um, Peter was the Mark's source. And what, what else? I think those are the two big things. And that Mark, Mark uh, wrote Mark. Those are the three big ones. That, and that it's between 50 and 70%. Now let's go back. Uh, let's fast forward a year to the present and, uh, and see what, uh, what the new research has found. Of this series on prolegomena in Mark's gospel, preliminary issues. I'm joined by um, Josh Pelletier, a former student of mine. He did a master's thesis Pelletier. that I supervised. Uh, no, it's Pelletier. I think you finished it uh, a little over a year ago or about a year ago. Maybe it was, I don't know. I oh, hang on. He finished it a year ago. And it's September, so that'd be September of 2019. Yeah, my interview with Mike Lacona was still before then. I forgot when you finished it, Joshua. But um, anyway, just uh, you did some fantastic work, and I really think uh, people can find uh, your research and what you found quite interesting. So um, let's just recap what we discussed in our first two videos. Again, this is our third and final one of it, but the first one, we talked about the dating of Mark. When was Mark, the Gospel of Mark, composed? Tell us a little, just summarize your findings on that. It's essentially the majority of scholars believe, about uh, 98 scholars believe that uh, the dating was 70 or earlier for Gospel of Mark. By the way, the survey was uh, 207, 208, and 98 say it's before 70 AD. Did he say 98? Something like that which is still a minority of the total, but the way they make it a majority, uh, I, I phrased that wrong because it makes it sound like they manipulated the data. But uh, the way they get a majority is they say, well, if they didn't say anything about the dating, then we don't count them. What, what really needs to be done is to get New Testament historians from all over the country not just English speaking. By the way, this survey was done with only English speaking, uh, English written, I should say. Get people from all across the world and talk to them on the phone and record it. Not just read their papers and say, and just ask them what the way I ask Lacona questions, ha ask them lean true, lean false, uh, strongly agree, agree, disagree, stuff, stuff like that and uh, maybe get a translator, interpreter if they don't speak English. Because I have a feeling, this is my, my gut intuition, that if you did not restrict uh, this to English papers, that the results would have been different and not into the Christian's favor. It doesn't matter to me, but it matters to them. They want that over 50%, so they got some, mm, you're right? So then Habermas can say, yeah, minimal facts. But let's get the Germans to weigh in on this. Let's get those German papers, those French French papers. Uh, looks like um, Josh has a French background. Get those French papers. Get get those Czech papers. Those Eastern European uh, historians to weigh in on this. Okay, and that came. What was the percentage of that? Out of the scholars, sixty-one percent. Yeah, if 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 we sample it based upon scholarly opinions, personal opinions. It's a little over uh, 61%, yes. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, and that's what Lacona said uh, over a year ago when I interviewed him, 50 to 70%. So they're saying that it was written... Or 50 to 70 years, the majority say, the Gospel of Mark was written. Before 70. Yes. And then you said, if we fine-tune that even further, it's in the 60s and probably... Uh, the most within that category would be 65 to 70. Yes, he just admitted it there. Oh, let's, sorry, sorry. Let's hear Josh's answer. Yes. Yes, so there we go. So this is a problem, I think, for Christians who want this uh, gravitas, this oomph behind it, is because what I said about the, the Americans uh, about to evade Saddam Hussein. Like, from the time that 9-11 that happened and all that, uh, the weapons of mass destruction and all that. How many years went by? 
I, I don't know the answer to that. It's several though, right? Before the invasion. It's like the writing that was on the wall from 65 to 70. And so if the majority of even Christian New Testament his historians say that it's 65 to 70, that puts the prediction of, that Jesus made, that great and wonderful prediction about the, the crumbling of the temple, that there won't be one stone over the other or on top of the other. By the way, which is false. Jesus lied. There's still, I think, a wall standing, so it wasn't completely uh, crumbled. Uh, yeah, it, it's not a huge prediction at that point. Okay. And then in our second video, uh, we talked about the authorship of Mark. And what did we find? Well, I don't remember the numbers, but uh, the majority of scholars hold to the traditional uh, view that Mark and or John Mark wrote the gospel. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah. The Why is that great? That's just a fact, right? Shouldn't be great or bad. <laughs> um uh, someone in the live stream comments was was saying, and this is another thing. Like, I know Christians will get mad when I say this. I know, I know. It's uh, how many of these that you papers that you went through are they historians and apologists? That they're historians and have a theological degree. Um, that are, are historians and are evangelical Christians. Genetic fallacy, Doug, genetic fallacy. You're saying that they can't be right or their research is flawed because of their background. I'm, I'm saying that it's very reasonable to think that if you are doing a survey of the Quran, uh, the historical claims of the Quran, that it behooves you to talk to historians that are not Isla Isla uh, Muslim, following Islam, right? That's reasonable, isn't it? I think it's extremely reasonable. Why is that? Because biases can influence how we look at evidence, how we see the data. So it's always good to have people of different biases looking at stuff. Traditional authorship, majority of scholars do, uh, uh, critical scholars since 1965, writing in English, your, your sampling included 207, correct? Yes. Seven. That's a pretty robust sampling. All right, and you're saying the conclusion is the majority of critical scholars since 1965 um, think that the traditional authorship of Mark is correct. Why 1965? Why not 1964, 60, 63? Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure they answered that question in a previous, but I don't, maybe they didn't, I don't know. Yes. Okay, so now we come to our third and final topic, and that is whether there was a Petrine connection um, involved. Did the author of Mark's gospel get his information or at least most of the information from Peter. Yes. <laughs> or some of the information, whatever. So we want to know Peter's involvement. Was Peter involved in this gospel? Uh, yeah. Does this information typically go back to Peter? So Mark, where, where do scholars think, Josh, where, uh, about Mark? Was he an eyewitness of Jesus? Um, yeah. What do they, what do they think? Uh the majority who answer that question or write on that question uh, don't think Mark was an eyewitness. They think that uh, they, 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 they hold to more of what the tradition says where Mark wrote down Peter. Okay, this is important. This is something that most educated Christians would, are, are aware of. But this is something for Christians who value evidence but maybe haven't really looked into it that much. Josh and Mike are basically both admitting that the very first gospel is not written by an eyewitness. The, vi the very first gospel that Matthew and Luke, that even Mike admits is probably over 50% dependent on Mark, and that he did probably admit that the gospel of John, written way late, is somewhat dependent on Mark, maybe a little bit. That the very first source about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ the, the, sorry, the very first author about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul said very little about Jesus' life and ministry, just the big, big picture stuff, is not from an eyewitness. Now, they're going to go on to say, but he got his stuff from an eyewitness. But it's secondhand. Everybody can agree with that. It is secondhand. Your sayings, and there's debate about whether or not he was interpreter or translator, but at the end of the day, he was... Peter was associated with the gospel in some form. Gotcha. All right. So why is the connection between Mark and Peter important? Well, um, 
The consequence of Peter being Mark's source is, as William Barclay stays, states, Mark's is the nearest approach we will ever possess to an eyewitness account of the life of Jesus. If Mark is the earliest gospel and Peter is behind that source, Peter being a close disciple of Christ, we have a very beautiful book in front of us. Um, Why does that make it a beautiful book? It could still be false, right? Yeah, or most of it. Yeah, well, I was thinking. Okay, so if Barclay is saying that about Peter, the closest we get to an eyewitness, of course, then he's rejecting the traditional authorship of Matthew and John. Good point, Mike Lacona. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe he thinks that uh, Peter was closer than those two. I, I have no idea. Okay. All right. So, yeah. what are some of the internal arguments that? Petrine tradition is behind the gospel. Well, f- remarkably, the internal arguments for Petrine tradition. Okay, I got I got Camille on the other line. If you heard some noise, that's Camille. And Camille, I got you muted because it was noisy in your background. I know you have a staff of five uh, uh, intern historian interns. You can hear me, right, Camille? Put your thumb up. Okay. Do you want to come on now? Do you want to listen to more of this, or should? Uh, uh, no, nah, I uh, this. Let's bring you on. I think you're more interesting than uh, these guys because I think we both know where this is going. So let me go like this. For those of you who don't know, Camille is um, he's in an undisclosed location in Eastern Europe. And he is... Uh, you're, you're in the... Did I... Put your volume up. Yeah, I did. Uh, unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I think everybody else Perfect. can too. Hi. So uh, do you tell people what you're doing right now with your life. I'm studying ancient history and ancient Greek philology. Okay. And you already have a PhD, right? Not a master's? Yeah, but it's an unrelated field. So I'm not technically qualified. Like uh, Both Josh and Mike at this point are... Well, actually, Mike Lacona has a PhD in New Testament studies, and Josh has MA, but the name of the program is Christian Apologetics. So I'm not sure what the degree is in. So I can't say how qualified he is. Okay. Uh, What are your thoughts on what we heard so far about the dating of Mark, the authorship of Mark, and whether Mark is actually who we think Mark is? Well, I have to say I'm thrilled that the thesis exists. I think uh, it's very important to look at consensus of scholars on a given topic. That's why, for example, I accept biological evolution, common descent, or anthropogenic climate change. Uh, And I would actually love to hear it. And there is one thing that I definitely want to say, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come on. And that's shame on Mike Lacona and shame on Josh because Mike Lacona specifically refuses to um, publish the thesis, right? Uh, because I repeatedly ask him, okay, great, uh, you know, your student did all this research. Can I get a digital copy? Because I would love to hear it. And you are going around making claims about what scholars say and what are the percentages and stuff like that. But nobody can actually check the work because nobody has seen it. Um, and Michael Akona says, okay, Josh wants to go on and uh, do his PhD. So he doesn't want to publish the results now, which means we will have to wait for another maybe four or five years because he's, before he's done uh, with that. Uh, and I think this is actually scandalous because in the country that I'm in, every university has a legal obligation to send every thesis, both bachelor's, master's, and PhD to a... Uh, online repository where everyone at any point can go and look up any student and actually read the thesis. You can, for example, Google mine. I have all three there. Uh, So I actually contacted Houston Baptist University, their library, and requested if it's possible to get an electronic uh, copy of the thesis. And the conversation was really interesting because first they told me that there is a digital repository of theses, but so far it only has 13 doctoral theses and six MA theses, uh, which is like shockingly low, given they have probably thousands of students. So I asked them about that, and they said that 
it turns out that the only department that actually submits the thesis into the repository is psychology. And they then said, it's possible that Josh Pelletier may or may not have had this thesis bound, but I do not see a physical copy here. He may have chosen not to place one here. Like, what country do you live in? Like, is there no academic transparency? Well, so you contacted the university and they basically yeah. said that it, is his thesis done is the question. And, and doesn't it have to be done before they can put it, upload it? Well, he finished it um, a year ago, as we've, as we've heard. Um, I don't know that for sure. But that's when he started, I, I think, what Mike said. Yeah, that's where he started. Uh, that can't be right, because Lacona has definitely been making claims about this for more than a year. Uh, but I mean, I don't know this for sure. But I think it's very probable that given that he's, uh, you know, having him on right now and doing these interviews, that the thesis is done already. And I mean, I ask him repeatedly for an electronic copy. And the reason that he gives me is not valid. Like it's, it's perfectly okay if Josh wants to take the thesis and maybe rework it into a journal article and send it to a peer-reviewed journal, or if he wants to reuse the material in a PhD thesis. But the point is that the MA thesis is finished. They are making claims based on the researchers in it, but nobody can actually see, you know, like I want to check uh, their results. Maybe I'm going to be convinced. But this is just scandalous. Like, imagine if that was done in any other field, like medicine, you know? Like, imagine if someone made a claim that carrots cure cancer. And if we asked uh, for the data, for the studies, they would say, well, you know, we, are, we want to do like a PhD about it. So maybe in five years, buy, you know, buy carrots because they cure cancer. Did by. you watch the other two uh, episodes? Uh, I haven't watched any, uh, to be honest, because my uh, academic semester is starting now and I have a lot of reading to do. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's great. That, uh, just again, it's great. Well, let me, tell you, let me tell you, I've watched the first yeah. two at 2x uh, granted, but I, I watched the first two and I watched uh, most of this one. And when they started doing the percentiles of the you know 45 to 55 whatever the percent was they were doing it on the fly like literally mike was taking a piece of paper adding things together josh wasn't do if this this is why i think the paper's not even done because if it were done you would think the basic math would have been done so when mike yeah. asked, asked a question what percentage of scholars like you would think that all the categories would be in the spreadsheet and and calculated I have a feeling that it's not done, and that's why it's not being um, uploaded. Well, I mean, if even if it's not done, we have like Mike Lacanos, his like his own words saying that no, he's not going to share it, you know. And it's not the, the copy or even a working version is not anywhere online, like in Academia.edu or um, ResearchGate or anywhere, you know. Um, I mean, this is troubling because I would love to check it. I would love to go through the scholarship and, for example, make sure that they didn't miss anyone. Uh, I would like to see if they included only critical well, they admit, sources. They admitted they yeah. missed people because they basically only took English written papers. That's That cuts off the Germans, the French. Sure. Is there anybody in your country uh, good at New Testament history? Yeah, yeah, there are departments that look into it, both in theological faculties and somewhere else, like in general history, you know. Uh, I would love, for example, love to see if they include devotional uh, biblical commentaries that have, like, general introduction, it, how they uh, qualify, like, how they de decide who is qualified, like, do, for example, people who only have degrees in theology and divinity uh are also like are they also included because i wouldn't uh, consider them to be qualified to discuss yeah, i think uh in the first video they said that it was only phds uh in new testament history but uh and again i'm not doing the genetic fallacy but my confidence gets lowered when it's attached to a theology degree as well hmm. yeah I, I, well, maybe the most important reason why i want to 
see the thesis is I want to actually check what are the reasons for, like what are the reasons that the scholars give for their dating? Like for example, if it's really the case that X percentage of scholars think that uh, Mark uh, is, you know, what, that the source behind Mark is Peter, what are their reasons? Like what percentage of them think that? Because that's what the early Christian authors recorded. They talk Just about like that. Yeah, they talk oh, about it in, in this video, and they talk about uh, the pros and cons of dating in the first video. Uh, basically, with this video, they yeah they uh, rely heavily upon Papias and their the Church Fathers. They rely on uh, First Peter. They rely on Acts. I think a little bit, and so that's the reasons. Yeah, I mean that that's fine, right? Like like there there needs to be transparency about it because it, it's like. It could be the case, for example, like, like there are scholars who date Mark early, but not for reasons that Lacona would like. Like Crossley, for example, wrote a book called The Date of uh, Mark's Gospel. I think I have it somewhere. And he actually dates it to mid-30s, to mid-40s, which is super early. He's not a Christian, as far as I know, or at least he is definitely not an evangelical or Christian uh, apologist. Uh, which and his dating, by the way, contradicts early Christian tradition because, according to the early Christian authors, it was written in the 60s. Uh, but the reasons that he gives for dating early, Lacuna would disagree with. And specifically in chapter one, he said, in the conclusions, he says, in chapter one, it was argued that the external evidence for the date of Mark was of little use in accurately dating the gospel due to uncertainties surrounding authorship and a dubious link with Peter. So here we have a scholar who would be counted in a category of pre-60s, but he also denies that the gospel was written by Mark and that uh, it's based on Peter's uh, eyewitness testimony, right? The thing is that if they only make these kind of generalizations and they throw some percentages around and there is no transparency, then... I don't know what to think about it, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you agree with me that uh, from their perspective, meaning they, meaning uh, Christian, evangelical Christians and so forth, that the dating, the authorship is important, but from my perspective, it isn't? It, this is actually really strange because if I, if I was a Christian, it, it, I wouldn't care when or who wrote the Gospels or any of the scriptures because it's supposed to be divinely inspired, right? So who cares what's the, if there is an eyewitness, like, is it important if it, it, when it, if it was written by an eyewitness? It is. If it's the case that it's also divinely inspired, like the Pentateuch su supposedly describes actual events and now nobody thinks that it actually goes back to Moses, you know, because most pe mostly people don't think that Moses existed. Definitely not how he's presented in uh, in the Old Testament, right? But it is important. Oh, yes. it, it is important. It is important to them, and I think you know why. It is because they don't want to look foolish for believing this stuff. They want to say we have good historical evidence to believe what we believe, and it's not just based upon this thing called faith or or we just we've experienced something at summer camp and therefore we believe the bible is true because we connect the dots between those two events and or because we saw flying trash can lids and therefore there's demons and angels existing and we connect the dots to this new testament and that's why it's yeah. important to them. Uh, let me ask you a question so this whole fiasco with lacona not being willing to publish or at least give away a copy of the pieces uh, who does this remind you of? Habermas. Yeah, exactly. I think Lacona is a very good student of his master uh, because Habermas for decades now is going around making claims about percentages of scholars who are convinced by arguments of the empty two. But he never actually published the, the list of scholars that are behind those numbers. So again, nobody can actually check his work, right? He is uh, supposedly editing like 5,000 uh, pages volume now, but who knows when it's actually going to go out. And yeah, I have some doubts about whether uh, like that's going to very rigorously cite all the sources that have been behind those claims for decades. It could be the case that like videos like these that Lacona made are, and the, the memes, the ideas that they presented are going to be around, like, 
making circles in the apologetic community for years now, but nobody will actually be able to go back to the sources because we don't have the source. Nobody has the thesis. And Lycona doesn't want to publish it. Okay, but w here's, here's, um, here's what we can do. And I know, I know, just like they know that Jesus rose from the dead, I know they're going to listen to this at some point. Mike Lacona and Joshua Patier, what, how do you say his last name? I know you have a 2003 Excel spreadsheet in front of you <laughs> with the list of those 207 names. Let's go step by step. Make those 207 names public. That's step one. Their full names, what universities they published in, and so forth. And I'm sure, I bet you, you could do that in 30 seconds. You hit, you take your mouse, you left click, and then you right click copy, and then you put it in an email, left click, right click paste, and send to, to my email address, which is in the about tab. That's all you have to do, Joshua. It's so simple. Habermas, if you're listening, yeah. do this exact same thing with all your stats. That's actually a great point. Like if, like Ona, for example, or Josh is worried about uh, publishing the thesis now because they want to reuse the material for some later work, let's at least publish bibliography, you know? Because at the end of the, the thesis, there is going to be maybe 10 pages that are just lists of various sources that they cite. And all of these 200 or whatever people, uh, scholars that they... they, they uh, counted should be referenced there right uh so let's just publish that and it doesn't uh, and have to be defined. it doesn't have yeah. to be in the academic uh format of you know I, I i can sense fear in josh right now like i'm feeling the force that if i send them this list and i made a mistake they're going to come back and say see you made a mistake no no i'm going to be so gracious and so kind and so loving to you just and i'm going to assume that it's at least 10 percent wrong just give us something, anything, <laughs> to start working at this. Yeah, and I mean, I, I'm not essentially, uh, I'm not necessarily doing this to, to poke holes in it as well. Uh, the reason why I want it is because, yeah, he, Josh, did like he invested probably so much time and energy into it, and I'm like very happy that he did, that he did that because I don't have to do it now, right? I can just take his work and I can like have a very good overview of the scholarship that's been written about it, right? Like, I'm interested in it. I read the scholars as well. So I want to have an overview of, like, a really good overview of the literature on the subject, right? So that I can, for example, see, is there anyone important that I missed? Uh, am I just, you know, reading, like, certain scholars and not some others, you know? Um, but we can't do that. <laughs> that's just insane, right? Like, think about it, you know? Uh, in any other discipline, with anything, yeah. nah, you, you, like your career would immediately end. You know, there is so much. Uh, like there are the standards for transparency are so big. When you are, for example, applying for grants and stuff like that, this just blows my mind. Like, is it is this normal in the U.S.? Is this just like a weird European thing because we are all socialists here or something like that? You know. Yeah, I don't think it's normal in the U.S. I'm from Canada originally, and uh, but I think uh, I think maybe the standards are lower in when it comes to this field. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it's it's really weird. Um, it's really weird. When do you think Gospel of Mark was written? Give me a range. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I would have to think about it because there is a lot of moving pieces. Uh, like I, I don't necessarily find it very convincing. Like I would definitely put the earliest uh, when the when the temple was destroyed, and there is the argument that the author didn't know about the full extent of the destruction precisely because he said that not like not one stone is going to be standing on top of another, which is not the case, right? Like we have the Western Wall still. Uh, so there is an argument that you can not only uh, like precisely pinpoint the earliest date, but also the latest date, and that would be fairly close to that because afterwards it would be known that the temple was destroyed, but actually it wasn't destroyed completely. So the author of the gospel would not say that it would was right because it would make uh, he would essentially make an uh, he would make Jesus make an incorrect uh, prophecy. 
But I'm not sure if I'm actually buying that argument. I think it's a, it's a little bit weak, right? And at that point, the latest possible date uh, is really tricky to pinpoint because it depends on dating of all kinds of other like pieces of literature. For example, the other gospels, uh, other works of early Christians that cite the gospels, whether they actually cite the gospels or not, and stuff like that. Um, so yeah. And who do you think wrote the gospel, Mark? I don't. I think we don't know. Who do you? Where do you think the Gospel of Mark was written? I think we. I think we are even like the, our level of confidence about where it was written should be lower than when it was written, uh, because you know, like it's a whole kind of can of worms about when it was written. But the arguments about specific locations are even weaker than that, like by an order of magnitude. The, the arguments for various locations, I think, are very, very weak. Yeah. Which is okay. Like, if, if you have any, like a, an anonymous source from antiquity, like pinpointing specific, lo- even with name sources like Dio Cassius, some people argue that it was written in Asia Minor because he, like, more often quotes uh, or mentions names of places, like cities and stuff like that. But yeah, that's, that's a pretty weak argument. If there was a if fifth there, gospel, which sorry, one? not Cassius, Herodianus. I have them confused. Go, sorry, go. Uh, I was going to ask go you on. if there were a fifth gospel, which one would it be? What do you mean? I mean, if you were to put an, a fifth gospel into the canon of the New Testament, what do you think it would have been? That's a really good question. <laughs> Thank you. Probably the gospel of the Hebrews. Okay, that's the incorrect answer. What we were looking for, okay. what we were looking for was uh, Josephus. Uh, he would be the one of his books would be the fifth gospel. And interestingly enough, there are Christian churches where Josephus is in the canon. Really, his works. Uh, I think the Jewish war. It's uh, specifically the Ethiopian church, and I think he's in like one of the extended canons. Which includes almost everything. Like their their Bible is like five times as thick as the, the Protestant canon, you know. Yeah, because which I, I think is pretty cool. Because <laughs> like, don't uh, doesn't Cam and and maybe even yourself believe a, a lot of the source material for the Gospels is from Josephus? I think there is a good argument for the Gospel of Luke and Acts, but I wouldn't be that crazy about other Gospels, like the Gospel of Mark. Like I, some people think that uh, you know a lot of the story of Jesus and the Gospel of Mark already is modeled after some people mentioned by Josephus, but yeah, I don't buy that. I like I think the argument, like the, it's possible, but the evidence is not very strong. Okay. Okay, well, we're approaching about an hour in. Uh, was there any last thoughts? Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, just, just uh, I like quickly fact check that. Uh, if I understood correctly, Lycona says that Plutarch quotes Asinius Polio indirectly, and he makes a parallel between that and the idea that there is this inclusio device and that Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, uh, references Peter as the eyewitness source behind the gospel indirectly. And I find it strange because I very quickly checked my edition of Plutarch. And for example, Plutarch in his biographies specifically mentions Asinius Polio by name. For example, in Caesar 46, uh, 1 to 3, Pompey 72.4. So if this was analogous, we would absolutely expect, if, if Mark, the author of the gospel, was operating under the same standard as Plutarch, we would definitely expect him to say, yes, and then Peter told me that this happened, because this is what uh, Plutarch does with, uh, with Asinius Polio. So I, I'm not sure if uh, Mike is probably incorrect about uh, like the specific author or something like that. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, this, is just, uh, this is just false. Yeah, it, it seems like... I get the impression that Michael Lacona downplays some of the better historians of the first century and second century. Like there were historians back then who said, by the way, I got this from so-and-so. I wrote this here uh, at this time, which you don't see in the Gospels. 
Well, not even that, right? Like uh, ancient historians and definitely good ancient historians cite their sources and they evaluate, critically evaluate their uh, reliability. And if the sources disagree, they tell you about it and they like give you a reason for, about like what, what they think, like whether they think one is better or the other. But specifically, if they themselves are eyewitnesses or if they have access to eyewitnesses, they are very enthusiastic about saying that. Because why wouldn't you? Eyewitness testimony, ancient historiography was very highly valued. We have many examples of ancient historians who talk about themselves being eyewitnesses, specifically say that they interviewed eyewitnesses. They command other historians for being eyewitnesses. They criticize other historians if they could have been eyewitnesses or could have got eyewitness testimony but, did, but didn't recommend getting eyewitness testimony in theoretical works about historiography from antiquity. So if the authors of the Gospels actually were eyewitnesses themselves or had access to eyewitnesses, and they were operating on the same standard as ancient historiographers, we would absolutely expect, for example, the Gospel of Matthew to say, and then I, Matthew, the tax collector, did that, 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 you know, mm -hmm. or this I got from Peter. And to be honest, in the Gospel of John, you have the um, the uh, figure of the beloved disciple. And specifically in, I think, two uh, places, the Gospel says, and the beloved disciple witnessed this, and that's why we know this is true, you know. Um, so yeah, in the Gospel of John, the beloved disciple is specifically functioning as an eyewitness. He is never named. Uh, so yeah. When I there's something there, Camille. When I first met you, I don't know <clears throat> how long have we known each other. It's over a year, right? Maybe two. I, I think it's definitely over. A year. It's, I think it's maybe more than two years. When I first met you, I remember you telling me that you would read how many hours a day or a week of like around first century historical material. I'm not sure, but I think now it's definitely more than that because I started studying it and like yeah, we have. We have to probably read more than like 5,000 pages in maybe 13 to 15 weeks, which is the like the length of the semester. Because when I heard what you just said, and you said it because I played that old clip of me and Lycona, and he, he referenced Plutarch, and you're saying to yourself, no, Michael Lycona is wrong here. I want you to guess, this is just a guess, do you think you're more well-read than Michael Lycona on this stuff? Yes, uh, and that's because I think um, I'm specifically studying classics, so I'm better read on the Greco-Roman cultural and like literary background of Christianity than he is. But he is definitely much better read on the actual Bible and maybe early Christian authors, right? So I'm not like I'm not saying he is better, like I'm better than him or he's better than me. We have just like. The Venn, in the Venn diagram, the, over, the overlap is not uh, 100 percent. You know, like there are different. Uh, we have like we invest our time. I can imagine in different literature, both primary and secondary. But from all the stuff you've read in your life about uh, ancient Roman history, things in this time period, and if um, the best historical sources you've read is a hundred, where would and the worst would be zero? Where would the Gospels be? Yeah, let's make it let's make it even more interesting. So, hundred is the best uh, historiographical source. A zero is somewhere in the middle, and minus hundred is like the most fictitious story that there is in okay. ancient literature, which is, which is called the true story, by the way, written by Lucian, and it's a sat it's a satire. But he specifically writes as outlandish a story as he can possibly make. Like he, for example, goes to space. He uh, meets like Martians and people from Venus and stuff like that. And he calls it the true story. That's the satire, right? So that's my minus 100. And 100 is the best, uh, which is either Polybius, uh, Tacitus. Um, yeah, I would say probably Polybius or Tacitus. Uh, yeah, and I would say Gospels are like minus 70. Minus 70. On that scale, yeah. <laughs> and I, I'm not saying like they are worthless as literature, right? Like I read the Bible almost every day because there, that's the point. That's the insane point that, that I'm like ob obsessing about Christians, especially Christians like Maclacona. They lose so much 
value that they could get out of the Bible because they don't appreciate it as a piece of literature. Because they have this insane like requirement that everything that it says must be true. But actually, if you see it for what it is, then you start to appreciate the genius of the people who wrote it, you know? Like, I don't think that Christian, like early Christian authors were stupid. I think that's genius. That's like brilliant. Mm -hmm. But you don't get to see it if you think that the events that it described actually happened, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a shame. Yeah, I view the author of the Gospel of Mark as like a Quentin Tarantino of the first century. It's like chapter one, Jesus starts his ministry. You know, chapter two, the transfiguration. And it's like, it's, it's quick, it's to the point, but yet it's brilliant. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. It's, it's definitely much, much better than some other uh, sources that I have to, had to read, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to start the music. You can hang around. We can talk after the live stream. I'll take some questions if there's any in the live stream here. I see we had some troublemakers in the live stream. I had to put a timeout. Does anybody have questions for Camille or myself? You got two minutes. Hey, Joshua Schrode, I see you're a fan of Camille and Cam Spires. Anyone wants to debate? <laughs> Would you ever debate? Hang on, let me, sure, turn, this I, down. Uh, let me turn this down. Would you ever debate uh, Mike Lacona? Several people actually told me independently that like Christians are actually scared because they don't like what they're seeing. <laughs> I, I don't think. Well, yeah, it's. Uh, if I was Lacona, I'd be scared of you. Because you could point out all the little things that he's getting wrong. Yeah, let's see some questions. Do you think Mark is. Brett Lowski, do you think Mark is more based on Pauline or Petrine theology? I'm not actually sure that we have Petrine theology. You have to reconstruct it. Like, if you, for example, think that the epistle of James is uh, more in line with what the Jerusalem pillars were preaching. Uh, but yeah, I think the gospel of Mark specifically is uh, it's coming out of the Pauline tradition. People are saying that you look younger than normal. You've got a haircut, right? No, I actually shaved my beard because my daughter oh. asked me to. But I don't like this look. You shaved, okay. Yeah. Pine Creek, how many youths have you led to hell so far? Well, the boss told me that I'm approaching a thousand. I actually got a really interesting email just yesterday and by the way it's not stuff like this that causes Christians to doubt it's I think a lot of it's the emotional stuff like um, that Jesus basically commanded the death of uh, children if you're a Trinitarian poof well my apologies to Josh and Mike Lacona they were scheduled to come on but we ran out of time maybe next time They'll show up with, uh, with Camille and me. Take care, guys. Yeah.